There was a time in my life Thought I had to do it all by myself I didn't know the grace of God was sufficient Didn't know the love of God was at hand Now I can say you are discouraged Struggling just to make it through another day You've got to let it go Let it all go And this is what you have to say <laughs> I'm going to say good morning everyone it's, uh, we're recording on a Thursday, but you're gonna get this on a Sunday. We're happy to be here. We've got one of our family members in town, just kind of, well, in town and here in the building, <laughs> helping us out today, and so we're feeling really good. We've been having a lot of fun, and we're glad you're here with us virtually. We're gonna get things started now. Well, wait a minute, before I do that, this is <laughs> Mark Hayes. I've got Mr. Paul Roberts. I've got Doug Allwater. I've got Ben Lifer joining us. My name is Lee Langston. We are your music team. I almost forgot that. Now, I release and I let go. I let the spirit run my life. And my heart is open wide. Yes, I'm only here for God. CSL. Uh, my name is Diane and I'm one of the practitioners. I'm going to do a treatment for you, but first I wanted to um, give you a quote about our core value, which is love. And this is a quote for, um, from Ernest Holmes. Love is the central flame of the universe, nay, the very fire itself. It is written that God is love and that we are his expressed likeness, the image of the eternal being. Love is an essence, an atmosphere, which defies analysis as does life itself. God is love and love is God. We live in a sea of love like a, like a water molecule lives in the ocean, separate but together, made of the same stuff, which is love. Our free will sends us flying around, forgetting where we are. I am a part of this sea of love, which has the qualities of the sea, which includes creativity. I hold this truth that we are all spirits having a human experience immersed in love and going in a good orderly direction at all times. I am grateful that this is true and I'm grateful that the laws work the way that they do and I release my word into the law and so it is. Well 
today's service. Wow, there is an energy here that has got to be much greater than just the few handful of people that are in this room tonight. And I know in my heart it is because this is a month of love and that is our core value. And our love that we are feeling here tonight and the love that we feel for all of you, whether you're coming to us from Facebook, from Zoom, from the podcast, however you are finding us, we love you, we appreciate the fact that you are here and I'm sending all of this energy out to you. Just, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I love each and every one of you. Let's go ahead now and get ready for our service and our lesson and let's say, our inten or say who we are. We are a diverse and inclusive spiritual community expressing God as love. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you. Uh, as Debbie said, thank you for joining us, however you're joining us on whatever platform you're on. Um, we're just happy to know that, that you're connecting with us while we're connecting with you in this way. Um, thank you all for coming in. Uh, this is, we're recording on Thursday night, so thank all of you who came in and gave up part of your Thursday evening. Uh, to do this for uh, the community that we love so much and want to stay connected to. So uh, by the time you watch this, I will have fulfilled my agreement with the Center for Spiritual Living in Tampa Bay and uh, recorded, uh, we decided to do a separate recording and not uh, try to do it uh, on top of what we're doing here tonight. So uh, by the time you see this, I will have recorded just an individual video and sent to them. Um, and um, you know our congratulations to them for winning the the Super Bowl and being uh, being gracious winners. So um, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more about that. So um, I want to continue uh, with um, you know our celebration of Black History Month this month, uh, the month of February, and. Um, the thing I wanted to share with you tonight was, uh, or this morning, is something that our uh, monthly publication, The Science of Mind magazine, has done um, to honor Harriet Tubman. Um, I don't know if you will be able to see this. Uh, Jill, if you can't zoom in on this, that's fine, don't worry about it. But uh, this month in the Science of, Mag Science of Mind magazine, they are honoring and recognizing Harriet Tubman for her, um, actually what they're calling is her light of love, faith, and courage. So um, 
Reverend Andriette Earle, uh, who's a minister in, at, a, a, at a Center for Spiritual Living, I believe in California, wrote, um, she did a lot of research and study about um, Harriet, and she wrote something um, in, in the magazine that I wanted to share with you because it's um, you know, something really beautiful about Harriet and her life and her character and how her courage and what she did can become personal to us. So um, the, the writer says, in my mind's eye, I have a compelling vision of Harriet Tubman, small in stature, muscles taut from a lifetime of physical labor, and fiercely passionate, ready, willing, and able. She was not frail, she was not demure. She was no nonsense, dedicated, and definitely up to what life required of her. In my heart's vision, Mother Harriet, as I call her, is an icon of pure love and amazing faith, willing to sacrifice her very life to liberate and save the lives of others. I am awed by her faith, the inner knowing and strength alive in her, and her courage to take all the risks that she took. So many things about Harriet Tubman inspire and resonate with me. In my core, I feel a connection to an experience she had as an adolescent that biographers recount in this way. She was in a dry goods store and she encountered a slave who had left the fields without permission. When the man ran, his overseer demanded that Harriet help intercept the runaway. Instead, she blocked the overseer's path. The overseer threw a two pound weight that struck her in the head. That injury caused her to endure seizures, severe headaches, and narcoleptic episodes for the rest of her life. During these episodes, she said she experienced intense dream states, which she internalized as religious experiences, a deepening of her spiritual connection. So the writer then kind of turns it to us, you know, to make Harriet's story personal to us. And she says, each of us has something from which we too must break free. I know we can through faith, fortitude, focus, and a sense of inner freedom. We too can stand in the face of the impossible. As a black woman, at this point in my life, I can't not take a stand in the face of the impossible. There is something inside each of us that knows nothing about, no you won't, or no you can't. We must look above and beyond impossible. I have always had an affinity for people who are living beyond, beyond the legal, beyond the emotional, physical, mental constructs of the enslavement binding us all. When everything around you says, no you won't, your divinity awakens you into a prodigal son or daughter moment, and you realize, yes, I am, yes, I can. So that's just a little bit about uh, the incredible woman that was Harriet Tubman. Um, you, you may already know, but she is called the Moses of the Underground Railroad. And for about 10 years, she helped guide more than 300 slaves, including some of her family, to freedom. So um, she was an incredible uh, woman of courage and character and worth definitely worth our uh, mention and, and honor of her life. So uh, happy Black History Month. Um, we've got two more Sundays that we will do something, you know, to honor this celebration in our country. So there is a story about a man who lived in a big city, but he grew tired of the size and the noise of the city and the frantic pace of city life. So he quit his job, sold his apartment, and moved to a small cabin in the woods, hoping to find the peace of mind that seemed to escape him in the big city. And for a few weeks, he thought that he'd found contentment, the contentment and the peace that he was looking for. But soon he began to miss his friends and all of the conveniences of living in the city. And when his contentment or discontentment continued to grow, um, he started to feel the urge to move again. 
So this time he decided that he would try living in a small cab, a small town. Uh, instead of living in this small cabin in the woods, he wanted to, he thought he would try a small town for a change. So there would be people that he would talk to and there would be the conveniences of the city, but without all the, fr uh, with all the, the hectic, frantic pace of city life and all the noise. So surely in the best of both worlds, he would find the peace that he was looking for. But life in a small town brought its own unexpected problems. People were slow to accept an outsider, but they were quick to pry into his personal business. If you've ever lived in a small town, you know how that goes. <clears throat> but soon he discovered that strange rumors about him were, were flying around and circulating uh, uh, you know, around town. And again, he grew restless and discontented. So he came to the conclusion that it was just not possible to find a peaceful life anywhere. So he moved back to the city where he had started and just resigned himself to a life of being unhappy and discontent. So the story begs the question, I think, in all of those living situations, who was the common denominator in all of them? Whether he lived in uh, the big city, whether he lived in this little cabin in the woods, uh, whether he lived in the small town, or whether, whether he was living in the big city where he started out. Who was the common denominator wherever he lived and wherever he grew unhappy and discontented? Well, of course, the answer is he was the common denominator. He is the only one who was in all of those scenarios. We've all probably known someone who bounced from one relationship to another. Uh, maybe they bounced from one job to another. Always finding something wrong with the other person and wondering why they couldn't find love or why they couldn't find a job they liked or why they couldn't find coworkers that they liked. So it reminded me of someone I knew probably, gosh, close to 20 years ago, but I knew him for about 10 years. And every two years, he had to buy a new house. So he would find what he considered to be his dream home, you know, decorate it just the way he liked it. You know, it was gonna be perfect. But then in about two years, he got tired of the house or he didn't like one of the neighbors. So he would sell that house and buy another dream house, fix it up the way he liked it and it was perfect again. And then in another couple of years, he got tired of that house in the neighborhood or neighbors that he didn't seem to like. And then I discovered he kind of went through relationships the same way. There was always something better out there somewhere else. So I'm not going to ask if any of these people have ever been you, but it still begs the same question. Who is the one person in all of those unhappy relationships or those unhappy jobs or those, those unhappy homes? It reminds us of the old adage, wherever you go, there you are. So the question, uh, or this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson is also the title of our lesson this morning. It's nothing can bring you peace but yourself. So em Emerson understood that no matter where you go or what we have or what we experience or who we're with, our journey is made in the company of our own consciousness and we return home with our own consciousness. We cannot get away from our own inner being. If we have a problem, we take it with us wherever we go. If we are saturated with peace and contentment, we take that with us wherever we go. And I think it's easy for us to fall into the trap of thinking that what gives us peace or what steals our peace is the relationship or the job or the things that we own 
or what we see on TV or social media. But it's really how we perceive those things that determine our level of peace and our level of contentment and well-being. <clears throat> so I have a quote to share with you from Charles Fillmore because he talked about this power we have uh, that each one, each one of us has, the power of our perception to perceive things the way we choose to look at them. He said, the mind is where we perceive the things we see, hear, and feel. It is through the mind, through this perception, that we see everything. This perception becomes what we call our life. So the man in our story that I shared with you a few minutes ago, he moved, the, the man that moved from the city to a small cabin in the woods, back to a small town, and then back to a city again, he was ruled by how his mind perceived all of his living conditions, all of his living situations. His mind determined his contentment and his discontentment depending on how he perceived each place that he was living. Now you could have lived in all of those same places that he lived and perceived each one in a totally different way and had a totally different experience living in the same place. But it would, be, would have been based solely on your perception of it. The mind is the seat of perception. It is through this mind that we see everything. This perception becomes what we call our life. So if you have been around new thought for any amount of time, you've probably heard uh, some of these quotes or these ideas that, that I have a slide to share with you. Um, but they're all about the power of our mind to create our life or to create, create the perception of what of our life. Ernest Holmes said, change your thinking, change your life. The Bible says, be transformed by renewing your mind. The Buddha said, watch the thought and its way with care. As the shadow follows the body, as we think, so we become. And Emerson said, we become what we think about all day long. So when I found my way into a New Thought Church, gosh, I guess it was over 20 years ago, the first thing I heard was change your thinking, change your life. It's one of New Thought's foundational beliefs. And I was so ready for a changed life, all I wanted to know was where can I sign up for that? But there were two pieces of information that no one told me when they said, change your thinking, change your life. The first thing no one told me was that the only person that could change my thinking was me and that I couldn't blame anyone else for what I thought. The second thing no one told me was that I would not change my thinking overnight. So I did what I assumed would work. I tried to fast track spiritual growth. <clears throat> so I thought, okay, I'll take me one of those eight week classes. Surely eight weeks would be enough time uh, to turn this all around, change my life, to change my thinking, and it would all be new and improved. Well, it all didn't happen in eight weeks, but things did start to change. It just wasn't fast enough for me. But what I started to realize was that our lives have been a practice of thinking and believing certain things for most of our life. We have practiced for years, for decades, believing what we deserve and the things that we don't deserve, what we're worthy of and what we're not worthy of. We have practiced believing where we're supported and where we're not supported or whether life is for us or if it's against us. We have spent our lives wiring our brains to believe the things that we believe. The good news is neuroscience tells us that we can rewire our brain and change the way we think. 
Ernest Holmes said, what the mind has thought, it can unthink. So I think there is actually good news in the idea that we become what we think about all day long, like the Buddha said. And I think it's good news because it does not say every random thought that crosses your mind is what you become. We are all probably glad that every random thought we've ever had is not what we became. We become what we think about all day what we focus on, what we give our attention and our energy to. It's not those random thoughts that just float in and out. It's what we focus on and focus on and think about over and over and over again. So how do we rewire our thinking or upgrade our thoughts? Uh, How do we renew our minds and transform our lives? Well, the only way I have ever known anyone to accomplish that is with practice. Because as I've said, we have practiced how to think and believe all of our lives. We're just not conscious of that too often. We're not aware that that's what we're doing. So we have to practice paying attention to what it is we're thinking and believing before we can change it. It's not possible to change something until we're aware that it needs to be changed. So there are three, they may not even sound like spiritual ideas, but there are three things that we can do that can practice that will help. And these are reminders not only of our personal responsibility for the quality of our thinking, but they also remind us that we have the power to do this for ourselves. And they help get us out of old patterns of thinking that we're just unconscious about and cause us to shift into maybe rewiring our thinking. So I've got all three questions up there at once and I'll just say a little bit about each one. But the three questions are to ask yourself, am I sure? Is there another way to think about this? And who and what has my time and attention? So the first question is, am I sure? Well, our minds are funny things. We love to think that whatever we think about something or someone is the absolute truth. I thought it, it must be accurate. Well, our mind is not really the problem. The problem is is that we believe that the conclusions we've come to must be reality. The people used to believe that the world was flat and they used to believe that the sun rotated around the earth. And they were so attached to the idea that we are the center of the universe that it was considered heresy when Galileo proved the earth rotated around the sun. So am I sure about what I'm so sure about? Or is it a story I've been told? Or is it a story I've told myself and concluded that it was true? So that's the first question we can ask to take us out of old patterns of thinking. Am I really sure? The second question that we can ask is, is there another way to think about this? So if I came to this conclusion, whatever this conclusion is, Could there be another one? You know, I made it mean this. I created this meaning. I could create another meaning or create another conclusion. So my friend said that they would pick me up at noon. And it's after 1230 and they aren't here yet and they haven't called to explain. How many rabbit holes can we go down to explain that? Well, I've been stood up. They are so rude and so inconsiderate. I can't depend on them. They don't like me. They didn't want to do anything with me in the first place. Those are conclusions that we could draw. And maybe those are old ways, old patterns that we think about when we're let down and disappointed. But is there another way to think about it that would be a brand new way to think? 
Could there have possibly been an emergency? Could something have come up where it's just impossible for them to call you? Or does it just need to be about me and my disappointment? So is there another way that I can think about this? Is there another conclusion to this? And the third and last question is, what and who has my attention? So Mark and I know someone who says they are addicted to the news and to social media. And the same person also doesn't understand or is just so surprised that she's angry and upset so much. Well, I finally asked one day, have you made the connection between the two yet? And I can't share what her response was, but it was a reminder, who gets my time and my attention? And whatever gets my attention and my time, does it work for or against my mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being? Who gets my time and who gets my attention? So those are the three questions that I think we can, that we can start asking ourselves. Am I sure? Is there another way to think about this? And who gets my time and attention? Those can take us out of those old pre-wired ways of thinking that we've just gotten used to and perhaps set us on a different path of thinking about things in different ways than we've ever thought before. So I think it helps sometimes to look at things in a lighthearted way and just have a little fun with it. So when I looked back on, um, I looked back a second time at those new thought thinkers, their quotes that I shared with you earlier, I noticed what they did not say in their quotes. So Ernest Holmes said, change your thinking, change your life. He did not say, change other people to change your life. The Bible said, be transformed by renewing your mind. It does not say, be transformed by renewing other people's minds. Emerson said, what you, you become what you think about all day long. He did not say, you become what other people think about all day long, or you become what other people think of you. They always point back to us. They always point back to the power of our own mind to create and transform and to become. <clears throat> so it brings us back to what our lesson was or is this morning. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. So the man in our story who moved from the city to a small cabin in the woods, to a small town and back to the city again, he found temporary peace. So there's nothing wrong with relationships and jobs and possessions. If you're popular, if you get some recognition and have accomplishments. The thing is, we just tend to forget that they are all temporary. And what we thought was bringing us permanent peace suddenly changed. So the more we can practice finding peace in our own quiet places, the more we find peace that does not change when the world around us changes. So let's have our spiritual practice this morning and let's practice finding those quiet places in us, even if it's just for a few minutes, so that we can just get a flavor of what it feels like to find the quiet, that quiet place that anchors us as things around us are changing. So let's begin our practice together the way we always do. Just invite you to close your eyes. 
to take a breath in, a nice deep breath, and when you're full up with your breath, slowly let it out. And let yourself feel connected to something greater than yourself. Whatever you call that presence, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how you connect to it. All that really matters is that you do connect. To know that it's there, close as your breath, close as the beat of your heart. And just feel yourself dropping farther down into your, the center of your being, to the place that is quiet and still. That place that is deep and wide and is just waiting for you to invite yourself in. It's always available, just waiting for you to say yes. And I think there's an interesting thing happens as soon as we get quiet. It doesn't take long for us to see how busy our minds are, how quickly we turn to the things outside of us, whether it's a problem or a challenge or someone else or something that's going on, how quickly we go there. But the goal of meditation or finding that quiet place is not to never think. The goal is not to stop our mind from thinking. The goal is not to become attached to the thinking. Because there's nothing we can do to stop thoughts from floating in. What we can do something about is if we hold on to them or not. Whether we grab a hold and try to figure it out or find the answer or whether we just let it pass through. And that's really the training and the practice of meditation is getting to that place where we're not so controlled and attached to our thoughts and so attached to our feelings where we can just sit and let them pass through and stay in that place of quiet peace. So let's practice that for the next few minutes. And just notice, yeah, there are thoughts that come through. There just will be those thoughts, whatever they are. But can you practice just for a few minutes, just letting them pass through and stay in that place of quiet, to stay in that place of peace?
out to someone to maybe get a hold of just that energy of love and hold it for yourself reach out to the prayer practitioners they are here for you they love you they will hold that love and hold that thought and hold those positive things for you even in the midst of craziness that may you may be feeling in your life they are here for you there are many ways to reach out to them Reach out to them through the website, cslkc.org slash prayer. Fill out an online prayer request card. They will get that information, keep it confidential, and pray for a whole entire week every day for you, holding those thoughts. Reach out to them through the prayer line, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. A different prayer is there ready and waiting for you. Also, the Zoom meetings after the services on Sunday, the link for those rooms are on the, the excuse me, the fake, ex <laughs> getting the words all tangled up. It's on the website. It's on the main page. The link is there. It's also in the Friday email that you get. Find the link, go in, schedule one of those rooms after service. They are there for you. Giving oh, is so important. Whether it's through your time, your talent, your treasure, whatever it is that you can give, please give. Financially, we have to keep giving here because this is how we make things happen. Trying times, I know they're all around everyone, but the more we give, the more we receive more we can do for our community, for this building, for all of you, and for everyone we reach out to. However, and whatever you can do is appreciated. You can give many ways, again, through the apps that are available, sending a check to the office, through your financial institution. However, and whatever you do, again, it is appreciated, and I say, namaste. I am so blessed. I am so blessed, I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful, I am so blessed. I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful. for the music. Good to see you, Ben. Thanks for being here. And thank you all for coming in and uh, doing what you do uh, to provide a recording for our community. Thank you for joining us on all the different ways that we're making available and to stay connected. Uh, so let's say our closing affirmation. This is how we believe God sees each and every one of us. So who are you? I am a perfect expression of God entitled to a life of love and joy. Have a great week. Thank <laughs> you.